Thank you for attending the Curry Research Lectureship Series. I am Jessica Whitaker, an assistant research professor with the Center for Advanced Study of Teaching and Learning. Uh, the series is sponsored primarily by the Virginia Education Sciences Training, or VEST, pre-doctoral fellow program, which is supported by the U.S. Department of Education, the Institute of Education Sciences. Today, we're delighted to welcome Dr. Amanda Williford, an outstanding researcher and clinician, and also a good friend and colleague. Dr. Williford's research explores how young children develop school readiness skills, with an emphasis on the development of social-emotional skills. She develops and evaluates classroom-based interventions for young children who display disruptive behavior problems. She's also interested in state efforts to increase high-quality early education opportunities and could spend another whole session talking about the research that she's doing related to that. Her clinical expertise informs her research and is focused on the assessment and treatment of young children, particularly in the assessment of externalizing behaviors and in providing early childhood mental health consultation. Dr. Williford is currently the PI on an efficacy trial to examine the impacts of banking time to improve preschool children's behavior. She recently led an effort to better understand children's kindergarten readiness in Virginia, and she is also the co-PI with Jason Downer on a grant to develop an early childhood mental health consultation model built upon an, the individualized classroom assessment scoring system. She is also co-PI with Daphna Bassock on a grant to examine Louisiana's efforts to overhaul their early childhood education system. So she's a very busy lady. <laughs> Dr. Williford received her undergraduate degree in psychology from the University of Virginia, Woo -woo! and she received her master's and doctorate degrees from the University of North Carolina at Greensboro. Dr. Williford will be talking for about an hour, and we'll leave 15 to 30 minutes for discussion or questions. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Williford for her talk entitled, Examining the Impacts of Banking Time to Improve Outcomes for Preschool Children Displaying Disruptive Behaviors. Thank you, Jessica. That was a very warm welcome. Um, I am really excited to be here today um, to get to talk to you about the results from an efficacy trial that I started not long after I came here. So um, Catherine um, Walcott is a graduate student of mine, and we were just talking about this morning how like, you know, we were in the second year of this trial when she came. She's in her fourth year. I think I was here just about a year before that. So, um, so it's nice to kind of have been here and be able to share this experience um, that has been a part of my experience at CASEL so far. So I just want to start by thanking my collaborators because I'm giving this talk today, but I really shouldn't be giving it by myself. I should have like 20 people up here with me giving this talk. So um, first, the co-PIs on this, Jennifer Locasali Crouch and Jessica Whitaker, have been just so um, incredibly encouraging and supportive and collaborative, and this really is a group effort. Um, and so lots of the things that I'm going to present on and touch on today are things that they um, made sure happened in this efficacy trial um, with high fidelity and have helped analyze this data and talk about. Um, Jamie DeCoster is our statistician at CASEL, um, and he's run most of these analyses for us. Um, Bob and Pianta and Bridget Hamry are the um, authors of the, of the intervention that I tested, and so their guidance was really important in us understanding the intervention and being able to design um, an efficacy trial to test it. Um, then I have lots of graduate students. Um, Karen um, Hartz Mandel, who was a two-year VEST fellow, Lauren Carter, Catherine Walcott, um, uh, several um, project coordinators who really made this project happen, and many undergraduate research assistants who spent countless hours um, cleaning data and coding video. Lots and lots of coding was, has been done um, over the last four years. Um, I have collaborators at the University of North Carolina Greensboro um, and, off, and also in Hampton Roads. Um, and finally, it's just the consultants, program directors, teachers, parents, and kids who participate in these, this project and other projects. Um, we just have to remember to um, remember and um, value their participation because they make this early intervention um, studies possible and they engage with us on things that we think might work but maybe don't work. So um, let me just um, 
identify the funding. This grant was funded by the Institute of Education Sciences um, from the National Center for Special Education Research um, in the early intervention um, and early childhood special education section. It's a goal three efficacy trial and the opinions are those of me and my colleagues and don't necessarily represent the U.S. Department of Education. So today, um, I'm going to talk to you. I'm going to provide just a touch um, on the background of young children who display disruptive behavior problems, describe the links between children's disruptive behaviors and the quality of teacher-child interactions. I'm going to describe banking time, which is the intervention that we tested in this efficacy trial. Um, I'm going to go into the design of the efficacy trial a little bit, describe the main impacts that we've had, um, and then discuss findings and future work. So, and we should have plenty of time for questions. So I'm going to present a lot of data. If there are questions that you have, burning questions, and you want to ask them, just go ahead and ask them. It's OK to interrupt me. Um, but we should have plenty of time at the end as well. OK. Um, so I use the term disruptive behaviors and externalizing behaviors interchangeably. And by that, I mean children who are displaying hyperactivity, impulsivity, low frustration tolerance, noncompliance, um, and or anger. These behaviors are relatively common um, in young children. People might say that um, three and four year olds are actually defined by these behaviors. They don't know a three or four year old who doesn't exhibit these behaviors. Um, and about 10 to 20 percent of kids display these behaviors at level that are causing significant impairment at home and school. For children who are living within poverty, those rates, um, those estimates are up to 30, sometimes 40 percent. So um, these behaviors, while common in some children display them, almost all children display them some of the time, some children are displaying them um, at high rates at either at home or at school. However, even for kids who are displaying those behaviors at high rates when they're three and four, those behaviors are often transient. So without any intervention at all, about half of those kids will go on to have typical developmental trajectories and look very normative later on. So here is just a picture that I think helps describe that relationship. So this is from some data that I collected, um, helped collect and then analyze when I was a graduate student and a postdoc at the University of North Carolina Greensboro. So this is a random sample of some kid children who were identified at two based upon parents' report that they were difficult to manage at home. And then we have tracked these children across time. These children are now young adults. Um, Susan Calkins was the PI of this project, so she's collected um, information on these children up through high school. Um, and so this is just children's disruptive behavior as reported by parents. So you see there are lots of different developmental trajectories that are happening here. And if you look, if you think about kind of the overall regression line, it goes down. So the normative pattern is to um, reduce in those disruptive behaviors, but there's lots and lots of variability. I'm most interested and in, intervening around here, this kind of three to four year old range, so that we can have more trajectories that are looking going down like this, rather than intervening over here or later when we know that those um, developmental trajectories are less malleable and less likely to change and harder to change. So if we think about children's disruptive behavior just within kind of the early childhood classroom, um, we can see that these behaviors are causing problems even when children are three and four. So children who display these behaviors in the classroom tend to be less positively engaged um, with peer, peers and their teachers and with tasks. They show fewer gains in school readiness skills. This is both in terms of academic skills and social emotional skills. And when we compare children who display these behaviors in preschool classrooms compared to K-12, these children are being expelled at three times the rate. So this is a problem for children even in preschool classrooms or childcare classrooms. And we also know that there's a significant impact on teachers' practice. So what early childhood teachers say is that these children reduce 
the efficacy of their classroom practice. If they're being frank with you, they will sometimes tell you, if this kid wasn't in my classroom, everything would be fine. I could, I could this child is preventing me from doing my job. Um, and so a lot of times they're just like, if I could just get rid of this one kid, all things would be good. Um, they report feeling ill-equipped to manage children's disruptive behavior, and this is the area that teachers tell us time and time again, they need more help, they need more guidance, and they need more training. So, and we know that teacher-child interactions are really important for children's social-emotional development. So the fact that these behaviors are disrupting children's practice um, is a problem that we want to address. So relationships are built through those moment-to-moment -moment interactions. Um, when we want teachers to be sensitive and responsive to children's needs, and that helps form a strong, positive, responsive bond between a teacher and a child that we know is really important for the development of children's social emotional skills, especially early on, right? And that is because we want children to see and be able to use the teacher as an emotional resource in the classroom. So young children really depend on teachers' scaffolding and guidance to help them control their behaviors and emotions, to interact with peers. That all happens through the proximal processes that occur through the teacher. We also want the child to be able to take in redirection and correction as part of the, and think about that or understand that as part of the learning process. That happens a lot when children are just learning to manage behaviors, manage emotions, learn how to cooperate and share toys. What we don't want is for children to think of that corrective and redirective processes that occur in preschool as an assault on their character. But if we think about teacher-child relationships and disruptive behavior, um, what we know is that those relationships that are characterized by shared affect, responsiveness, and supportiveness are protective for these children, but they're much more likely to experience interactions in a relationship that's characterized by insensitivity, high conflict, and high negativity. And that Teacher-child interactions and relationships that are characterized by these um, aspects are more like, are linked to increases in externalizing behavior and school problems. So it's really hard for these children to be able to learn those social-emotional skills that they really need when this is what they're experiencing in the classroom. So I want to just kind of think about that a little bit more. How do these disruptive behaviors kind of impact and influence kind of adult and children's kind of representations or schemas about their relationships with each other since we know that they are so important. So when I think about kind of adults and think about how we tend to see children who behave impulsively, who are easily frustrated, and who um, are easily angered and who can't remember the rules in the moment. So we know that it is kind of human behavior tendencies to pay attention to negative events more than positive events. We all tend to do that. Negative events tend to be more salient to us. The other thing is that we tend to unintentionally misinterpret negative behaviors. So this is part of the fundamental attribution bias. When other people display negative behaviors, we think of them as causal, unlikely to change, and something to do about their character. Whereas if we display some negative behavior, it's totally situational, almost never happens, and had nothing to do with us. So um, we do that as humans, that's intentional. We do it with other adults, and we do it with little kids as well. And then we know that children's dysregulated behavior dysregulates us. It sparks our own emotional reactivity um, which prevents us from using high order thinking. It's the reason why when a child is in the middle of a tantrum and they're screaming, you say stop that instead of you're really frustrated. Let's take some deep breaths together. Okay, how are we gonna figure this thing out, right? So that's what's happening kind of on the adult side. And then we know that children also develop their own ways of seeing. So if you think about this again, 
This is, a, if you think about that kid who is impulsive, aggressive, not able to remember the rules in the moment, they're probably receiving lots more corrections, redirections, maybe even um, experiences of frustration by the adult. Um, and if you think about that and to how many acknowledgments or um, praise and positive attention they are receiving. That's happening both within them, that, that own ratio within the child is off, and they're receiving those corrections and redirections may, way more frequently than other kids in the classroom. So then think about how the child perceives what's, how that child might perceive what's happening. Maybe it's that this teacher or this adult doesn't like me very much. And then think about how other children might be perceiving what's happening. So kids notice what's going on in the classroom, and then they start picking up, eh, maybe this teacher doesn't like this kid very much. And then through that, and when children are impulsive and they're more likely to snatch a toy, they need that redirection, right? So it's not that we're necessarily correcting kids in ways that we shouldn't, but they need more of those, and often we're not balancing that with the more positive interactions. And then we may be inadvertently communicating kind of unfair treatment or targeting. So banking time um, is an intervention that was created by Bob Pianta and Bridget Camry that really works to offset those experiences and that relationship that's occurring. So it's an attachment-based teacher-child intervention um, it's designed to improve the quality of teacher-child exchanges and really disrupt those negative interaction patterns that may be happening in the classroom. And they do this in part by providing new information to the teacher and the child. Banking time was developed um, as an intervention that could be used if a teacher was experiencing um, a challenging relationship with a child for a number of um, issues. I was really interested in it as an intervention that could be used in the preschool classroom with children who are disruptive, in part because it was different from the interventions that I had kind of worked with and tested before. So before coming to Castle, I had done quite a bit of work on parent-child um, relationships and interactions. I had done quite a bit of parent training work. And, um, and this intervention directly parallels kind of one aspect or one part of common parent training programs. So parent training programs for kids who have disruptive behavior problems often have two components. The first is um, a kind of a section to really repair the parent-child relationship. It's often based in attachment theory to make sure that that secure and emotional connection between the parent and the child is there. And then the second half um, of parent, typical parent training programs is based in learning theory um, and really looks at kind of reinforcement using effective commands. Um, so we're talking about um, reinforcement theory around that. And so I had seen those paired in the parent-child literature, and I had done some work in the early childhood mental health consultation model. That work was pretty much all focused around learning theory and around reinforcement. So I was really interested in this intervention because it kind of took that front end piece that I saw in the parent training program, blew it up a little bit, and was a packaged intervention for teachers. And so it was a way of viewing children and interacting with children that I have not seen in a lot of other um, early childhood treatment programs. So I thought it would be really interesting to design an efficacy trial that really tested whether the use of banking time in and of itself would be effective in improving children's um, behavior, um, pre in specifically preschoolers who were displaying disruptive behaviors, and if that was gonna happen through improvement in teacher-child interactions. Questions so far? Okay. Before I talk to you about the design of the trial, I just wanna briefly touch on some, give you some more information of what exactly banking time is. So these are play sessions that are um, between a teacher and a child, so we're talking about individual play sessions that um, are designed to be about 10 to 15 minutes in length to occur two to three times a week, um, that the session times are regular and predictable, and where the teacher follows the child's lead. 
important, these are sessions that we ask teacher to carve out of their regular day. So it's not, an, it's not something that is happening at a different time of the day. It's supposed to be something that's supposed to happen in the context of the regular school day. We ask teachers to find a quiet location. Um, it can be, ideally, it's a place kind of away from the classroom and the other kids, but it could be in the corner of a classroom. Um, we, in terms of materials for baking time, it's age appropriate, um, toys, things that are chosen for the specific child, and that encourage ex exploration. We're really interested in open-ended activities. Um, so there are some activities that, that are great activities for young kids, but wouldn't be good banking time activities. An example of that is book reading. Book reading tends to be adult-led. It tends to not be open-ended. Um, so that would be, that's a great activity to do with young children, but it's not a particularly good banking time activity. What we try to stress with teachers, though, is it was less about the activity itself and more about how the activity was conducted. So a game can very quickly be open-ended and child-driven or teacher-driven. The other thing that's important about banking time sessions is the behavioral standards are different within that session than they are likely to be in the classroom. So for example, a child may be in a banking time session and, get in their, and the teacher and the child are drawing together, the child gets frustrated and they start breaking crayons. And the classroom, you might, that might be a rule that you don't break crowns and you pull the crowns away and the child has to take a break from the crowns. In a banking time session, you would simply say, wow, you seem frustrated in that drawing and you're breaking crowns, and continue to let the session go. Um, the, and then the other import, important part about that is that we wanted banking time sessions to not be contingent upon the child's behavior. So sessions should be carried out in advance and regardless of the child's behavior. So this was really important. We wanted teachers to schedule these um, interactions in advance and do them no matter what. So the, the child may have been in time out at 9.59, but if you're supposed to do banking time at 10 o'clock, you need to go and do banking time. And we didn't want teachers using banking time as a reward for positive behavior or a punishment for negative behavior. And then the other important parts about banking time are really the teacher's role during those sessions. So we asked teachers to play the role of follower, to emphasize the child's interests, motivations, and points of view, and to encourage the child's autonomy and freedom. So these sessions should be really child-led. Traditional teaching of skills isn't part of banking time. That was really hard for teachers. Um, because, as, because of that, we asked teachers to not ask questions, to not give instructions, and to really try not to praise desired behavior or ignore negative behavior. Um, so let me just play. This is um, a video example that's gonna show, really show the highlight of the child versus teacher led. This is one of our training videos. That, um, that we created kind of at the beginning of this trial. This is mine. Here. Now yours. We connect them together. We connected them together. Now connect it to, to that side. yours and then connect it to mine? Yeah. You're going to make a tower and then connect it to mine? Yeah. That sounds very big. Well, you can, we can connect it. Mm -hmm. Wow, you are connecting it to mine and making a very long tower.
come here for a second. Can we count how many there are? Let's see how far we can count. No! No? Okay. Can you come and sit over here and we'll go back in the box. We'll play with them, okay? What? Oh, there's some on the ground, too. Do you want to switch and play with something different now? Yeah. Okay, then can you come sit in the chair? I'll get the box if you come sit in the chair. Break them all apart. Can you tell me what color are these ones? Blue. Blue. Good job. What color are these ones? Green. Green. I'm putting the green blocks in. Ooh. Ooh, you found a green just like my green. Can you find a yellow one? You found a yellow one. Thank you, Molly. What color orange. is this? Orange. Is this orange? No. Which one's orange? Wow. Okay. So I like that video maybe mostly because it's my daughter when she was three years old. <laughs> um, no, I like that video um, because I think it really shows what the difference is between that child directed part and the teacher directed. Um, so could everyone tell when the shift was right? It was pretty obvious. Um, and the child's response at that moment, no. <laughs> so um, the, uh, when, sometimes when I play this tape for teachers, I will ask them to watch it once and pay attention to just the teacher. And when I do that, teachers often say, oh, that teacher just seemed really stilted at the beginning. That seemed really awkward. Um, the second half of that is, looked much more natural to me. I liked that part better. And then I have them watch it again and I have them just pay attention to the child. And, if, and, they don't, and sometimes they just don't see the child at first. And then they realize how the child doesn't really notice that difference in the interaction. The child is very engaged throughout that interaction. Um, so, and then the other thing, and we'll go through this in a minute, is that because teachers aren't kind of teaching a skill, giving directions, directing the play, instead, they, we ask them to do several other components that are critical for banking time. We ask them to observe children's behavior, to narrate what the child is doing, to label um, the child's emotional state, and to communicate relational themes. So I'm going to go over those, um, just touch on those a little bit more in depth and show you some examples of each of those components. So we ask teachers to carefully watch and take mental note of the children's behavior and also to be aware of their own thoughts and feelings. So this is important because it allows the child to take initiative and lead, and lead the session. So we just tell teachers, sit back and watch for a few minutes. That's, that um, takes a little while for teachers to get used to it first. Um, it allows teachers to see and understand the child's strengths, interests, and personality, and it conveys that the teacher is interested in the child. We also ask teacher to kind of narrate. So there are several ways that you can narrate a child's behavior. The most common way is what we call the sports caster technique. It is simply to describe out loud what the child is doing. If the child is stacking blocks, one on top of the other, you're stacking blocks, one on top of the other. You can also reflect back what children are saying. The child says, oh look, I'm stacking the blocks. You're stacking the blocks. <laughs> um, and then also to kind of imit quietly imitate what a child is doing. Same example, child is stacking blocks, you stack blocks, one on top of the answer. The narrating shows that you are supporting the child's play, you are accepting what they're engaged in, and, you're, and as a result, you are accepting them, and it lets the child know that he or she is leading the session. So here are just some examples of what narration looks like. <laughs>
Okay. The next thing that we ask teachers to do is to label or communicate out loud children's emotional state. And it lets the child know that it's okay to experience both positive and negative emotion. And it helps pair words with feelings so that words become tools for expression. Thank you. Oh. Yeah, both of us are adding beads to our streams. I'm gonna move the box right here. You're looking all through the box for the next one that you want. I saw a little teeny tiny square, but I'm thinking that I can't find it. You can't find the little teeny tiny square that you want. The wine had it, he put it in here, but now where is it? I wonder what happened to it. We don't know where it is. I'm disappointed. You're disappointed because you can't find the piece that you wanted. It is disappointing when you know exactly what you want and then you can't find it or you can't have it. Sometimes that's frustrating too. So I think what a teacher's tendency might have been to do there is to help solve that problem. Let's go look for it. Let's go find it. But instead, she just acknowledges that emotional state and empathizes with the child. The final thing that we ask teachers to do um, is to communicate relational themes. So what are relational themes? These are messages that we want a teacher to explicitly convey to a child about the importance of the relationship with that child. Um, so it really is words to go along with the child's emotional experience during a banking time session. Um, it helps teachers define the teacher-child relationship for that particular child. And really, the goal is to help the child understand the teacher's role um, and the role that other adults can play for that child's life. Um, and it is supposed to provide a connection or a bridge between the banking time sessions and life in the classroom. So these are just some examples that teachers used um, as emotional themes. And then here is a video example. Can you make a square? That's a book. You want my help to make a book? Yeah. I will always help you. OK. So as you can see, that in these banking time sessions, we are highly constraining the interactions that are occurring. And so in banking time, that's designed to increase the warmth and supportive qualities of those interactions, and also to decrease the negative and directive interactions. So it's not just the time that is spent with a child, but it's how that time is spent that seems really critical um, in banking time. And it's that aspect um, that we really thought about when we were designing the efficacy trial. So we ended up creating kind of three treatment conditions um, when we decided to test this intervention. We had kind of a, the true experimental condition or the banking time condition, and then we had a typical business as usual um, where teachers were conducting their classroom as they typically would, but we added a third condition that we call child time. And the purpose of child time was to say, OK, maybe it's not just the time spent, but it is how that time is spent. So we asked teachers to spend equal amounts of time with a child, but they were not doing banking time, and we didn't constrain how they were interacting with those children at all. So let me just go through those um, three conditions in just a little bit more detail. So business as usual um, is pretty straightforward. In the banking time and child time conditions, we asked teachers to conduct individual child um, sessions with a particular child to do that 10 to 15 minutes per session, three times a week for seven weeks. And then teachers ended up working with three kids across the year. In banking time, we asked teachers to do banking time. In child time, we gave them no instruction at all. We said, spend time with kids. And we really wanted this to be the difference. So in banking time, teachers, part of the, um, part of the intervention 
um, teachers have access to a consultant who helps them implement baking time. Um, so we also provided a consultant in the child time condition as well. And they met with teachers weekly, alternating face-to-face -face and, phone, and phone weeks. So that is the same across these two conditions. For the consultants um, in the banking time condition, the focus was on, on improving their fidelity of banking time. For the consultants in the child time condition, we asked the consultants to just give unconditional positive regard to teachers. Whatever they were doing, it was great, <laughs> they, and keep doing it. Um, in the banking time, and this is where we do have a, a difference, in the banking time um, condition, we asked teachers to submit one video of their banking time sessions per week to the teacher. We did not ask consultants um, we did not ask teachers in the child time condition to uh, submit videotapes for us. In part, that was because we didn't want to constrain what the child time teachers were doing with kids. So lots of times, um, teachers in the child time condition were reading books, they were helping kids with writing activities, it, um, they were doing things to kind of support children's school readiness skills. So, although sometimes they were like, we're going outside to run, <laughs> or we're gonna go um, run errands within the classroom. This kid needs to move um, in my time spent with him. We didn't wanna constrain that. And then the other reason was these videos teachers, um, consultants used to help teachers reflect upon their banking time practice. And we did not need to do that in the child time condition because whatever teachers were doing um, was fine. So in terms of um, the sample that we have, we ended up with 173 classrooms and 183 teachers. Um, this is spread out across three sites and the trial was conducted across three years. Um, we had a really diverse sample of preschool programs, a mix of state funded Head Start and private programs. The private programs, some of them were half day, some of them were full day programs that ran from six in the morning to six at night. Um, our teachers were mostly female um, and, and pretty um, variable in terms of demographics um, and education. So we randomized at the classroom level and we stratified that randomization by site, where we were in each of the three locations, type, whether it was state funded, private, um, or Head Start, and then also by building size. So if we were in a large building, we randomized within the building. In terms of children, oh, we have more teachers instead of classrooms because we had some teacher mobility and if a teacher, um, if a teacher left the classroom, we would try to replace that teacher. We had 471 kids. On average, that was about three children, two boys and one girl. Um, selected within each classroom. They were, um, we selected the three children, um, or the two boys and one girl, who displayed the most disruptive behavior based upon a disruptive behavior rating scale that the lead teacher completed. Um, kids fell within the 80, on average, between the 81st and 84th percentile of ADHD behaviors. We think we got the most disruptive kids in the classrooms. Um, kids were about four years old, so these could be three or four year old classrooms. And we have a pretty diverse sample in terms of demographic. Um, with, um, and then most of the kids were within, um, living within low income backgrounds. Okay. These are the primary outcome measures. So we have a kind of multi-method um, approach to um, to our data collection here. We got both parent and teacher's report of children's disruptive behavior, and we also got teacher and parent's report of children's improvement in their effortful control or their behavior control. Um, we also have observed child behavior, so um, I'm not gonna go into the in-class, but this is where, um, in great detail, but we went into the classroom and we observed children in 10-minute cycles we got about eight cycles per child. And for behavior control, we were looking for behaviors such as sitting calmly, regulating movement, respecting other space. Um, we also assessed observed teacher-child interactions, again, with the in-class. So we were looking for children's positive engagement with the teacher. Are they seeking the teacher out? Are they sharing positive affect with the teacher? And then also child conflict with the teacher. Um, are they showing aggression, either verbal or physical, 
negative affect or non-compliance towards the teacher. Um, we also looked at teacher-child interactions within the context of a teacher-child structured play task during a cleanup portion. I'll talk about that for, in just a minute. And then we got teachers' report of the relationship using the teacher-child relationship scale. So the teacher-child structured play task was adapted from mother-child inter uh, mother interaction task that's been used frequently in the developmental literature. It's an attachment-based coding system. And we took that, we went to the original coding system and then adapted that to be used um, for teachers and children. So these, um, this was measured within the context of a 20-minute play session, standardized play session. So at the end of each intervention window, we had the teacher and the child play together in a very standardized fashion. So we had Lincoln log logs and Tinker Toys the data collector would dump those out in a spot and ask the teacher and the child to play with those however they wanted for about seven minutes. After seven minutes, the data collector would come in and say to the child, child, clean up and sort these toys. They would do that for three minutes, and then that was followed by a book reading. We have up to this point coded the free play and the cleanup for both quality of teacher-child interactions and also fidelity of the banking time um, behaviors that we would expect to see across all three conditions, um, across all teachers. So these, in terms of the outcome measures, these are the codes that we, um, that we coded to assess the quality of teacher-child interactions. Um, each of these, sensitivity, positive affect, confidence, encouraging, stimulating environment, supporting child autonomy, affective mutuality, directiveness, and negativity are all global codes on a five-point scale. So the coder would watch the interaction, either the free play or the cleanup, and then code the teacher-child interactions on these behaviors. They summed up into two composites, teacher positive interactions with child and teacher directiveness or negative. Let me um, summarize the data collection because it's a little bit complicated. Um, this was kind of our original um, design for the trial that we would consent teachers, collect baseline data, select the kids, randomize classrooms, and then randomize children to the assessment windows, all at baseline. And then we would do pre and post assessments for each child at the end, beginning and end of their window. <coughs> Based upon the reviews from IES, they said, eh, we'd really like for you to look at the beginning and end of the year as well. So we supplemented that data collection routine with collecting additional data just at the beginning and the end of the year. And then that structured play task is only at post. So um, we only ask teachers to do that one time with the child. So they did it with child one at the end of intervention window one, child two at the end of window two, and child three at the end of the Okay, um, just a touch on implementation. I'm not gonna focus on this, but um, we found that the consultants displayed good fidelity to the intervention, and on average, um, teachers um, had good engagement for us. We did code the fidelity of banking time intervention um, based upon the DPIX um, manual that is um, from Sheila Iberg. Um, we've coded that behavior in banking time sessions for banking time only. I'm not going to talk about that, but we also coded the banking time behaviors in free play for free play and cleanup across all conditions with coders who are blind to condition and blind to the intervention. And just quickly, what we find is that teachers who are in the banking time condition during that free play portion of the structured play task um, are behaving differently compared to teachers in the child time and business as usual condition. So we see that during free play, te banking time teachers are doing more of the things we want to see, more of those banking time behaviors, and less of the things we don't want them to be doing, which is basically less of the teacher direction. So we feel like we, we had a change based upon the intervention. 
So let me talk about the data analytic plan for the main impacts. We conducted regression models um, that examined the effects of treatment on outcomes at the child level. We have two sets of models, one with dummy codes for the intervention so that business as usual is the reference group, and another set so that child time is the reference group. We account for nesting of the classrooms. We use maximum likelihood estimation to account for missing data. As you might um, imagine, this is a year-long trial. We had losses of teachers and losses of kids. Um, we control for sight, window, um, we can, year, that's not in here, um, child baseline disruptive behavior, child ethnicity, child age, parent education, and family income to needs. Um, and we used baseline or pretest when available so that tests are predicting change. So in terms of the child behavior results, what we found was that teachers in the banking time and child time condition reported decreases in children's disruptive behavior, both from pre to post test and from baseline to the end of year. They also reported increases in children's effortful control from pre to post. We didn't collect that data from baseline to end of year. Parents, um, this should say, oh, parents in the child time condition reported decreases in children's disruptive behavior from pre to post and baseline to end of the year. And parents of children in child time and banking time reported increases in children's effortful control from pre to post. And we did not collect baseline to end of year data. We did not find main effects on observed child behavior or their behavior control in the classroom. In terms of teacher child results, we also did not find main effects on children's observed positive engagement with teachers in the classroom or their observed conflict with teachers within the classroom. And I'll talk about that um, in the discussion. Um, we also did not see change in teachers' perceptions of their relationships with children. We did see that teachers in the banking time condition only evidenced fewer observed negative and controlling interactions at post during that cleanup of the structured play task. And they also evidenced fewer positive interactions during that cleanup of the structured play task. That had mostly to do with positive affect and the number of questions that were asked. So if we control for that, then those results go away in terms of the positive. We did not find evidence of mediation. This one comes close, but, there, um, but we are seeing kind of main effects, but um, not that it's mediated through the teacher-child interactions. And I should also indicate that the, um, the effect size for those effects um, are modest. Um, the other thing that I just wanted to touch on in terms of main effects is that Bridget Hatfield, who is um, an assistant professor at Oregon State University, she was a postdoc here a few years ago, a vast postdoctoral fellow. She um, worked with us from 2010 um, to 2012 as a postdoc. And in her first year, got an early career award um, from Division 15. Bridget is interested in children's physiological stress response um, um, and the links to childcare experiences. And so she had some supplemental data collection where she collected cortisol on children during year two of our trial. So um, cortisol is a hormone that's secreted by the adrenal glands and it's often used as a measure of children's stress response. The normative profile for children's cortisol is to be high in the morning and then to decline across the day. The research in childcare has shown that lots of children show a different response when they're in childcare, that their cortisol levels actually increase across the day, showing that those, that children, um, or we're kind of been indicating that children are showing an increased stress response as, as a result of childcare. Bridget's done some work that shows that those patterns of cortisol is contingent upon the quality of the teacher-child interactions. So she was really interested in collecting that data um, as in, in concert with this trial. And what she found was that we saw declines in cortisol levels across the day for children in the banking time condition only, compared to both children in the business as usual conditions and in the child time. Okay, so in terms of summary, we found that children who display disruptive behaviors 
benefit from spending individual time with their teacher. So teachers perceived children improving in their behavior and parents perceived children in, um, improving in their behavior. And this is really important to us. And frankly, the parent reports were um, a little bit surprising or those impacts were surprising to us. So we consented all kids at the very beginning of the year and we told parents, your child may or may not be selected. And if they're selected, they may or may not spend some time with their teacher. Um, and then we gave them no more information um, about the intervention at all. So it is possible that teachers were telling parents that they were spending time with kids. It's possible that teachers in the intervention conditions were less likely to say that, that those children were um, displaying um, negative behavior in the classroom as a result of spending time with them. Or it's possible that teachers in the banking time and child time condition were more likely to say positive things that they learned about the child as a result of their um, time spent. Any of those things seem like really good outcomes for these types of kids. Um, so t adult perceptions of children is how we make decisions about kids. It's how kids get kicked out of preschool. It's how children um, are identified for, for special education. So changing teachers' perceptions or changing adults' perceptions I think is important. Um, we, but we didn't see main effects on observed child behavior and we thought that we had designed um, our trial and gotten enough data collection on an individual kid in order to detect that. We were often in the schools observing kids at each time point for up to three days. We got over an hour of observation on each child. Um, so we have really rich observational data. So it was disappointing a little bit for us not to see that. It could potentially be due to our protocol we were interested in assessing children's average experience or their average engagement. So we assessed children, we observed children in whatever they were doing across the day, but it was not necessarily tied to were they interacting with their teacher. We could have assessed them as they were interacting with their peers, and we might not necessarily expect that spillover effect. So we could have tightened our observation to um, be contingent upon. The child had to be in close proximity to the teacher during that cycle for us to see it. Um, the other thing is that we saw very little negative behavior or even really very little differences between the kids that we selected in terms of their engagement. If I compare their average means to other samples of kids who are at risk due to um, living within low income backgrounds but not at risk for behavior problems, the means look very similar. So um, either these kids who are identified as being disruptive really aren't disruptive, um, I don't think that's the case, or somehow in our, um, in our observations they're just not, they just weren't sensitive enough to pick up on that information. We do, I didn't go into this, but we do see some moderated effects where we find that um, in classrooms where teachers displayed lower quality teaching interactions at the classroom level, we do see intervention effects where though in those classrooms, children who participated in child time or banking time are showing more positive engagement with their teacher. So importantly, all of these effects we see for both banking time and child time. And I imagine, sometimes I think about what if we hadn't included child time as a condition? You know, we would have had a really different story, I think, potentially about banking time, that this is an, um, an effective intervention, and we may have made statements like, and the way, it is the way that you are interacting with kids that are making that change. Having this condition makes us really think about that. So at least if we're thinking about changes that we saw in child behavior, we have to think about what just spending time with kids means. So I don't think it means that quality is not important. I think it is that teachers, when they spend time with children and activities that they think kids will like, the quality is probably high. And there are different ways to have high quality experiences with kids. If this was all the only data that we collected, I would have said, huh, child time's a lot easier to implement. I think we have a new intervention, <laughs> but it's not. I think we have to pay attention to um, those impacts that we got only for banking time. So only in banking time did we see um, have impacts on teacher-child interactions during that structured play task. 
and only children in banking time showed um, a reduced stress response. So I have to think about whether or not that link in the stress response might be due to reduced negativity and reduced directiveness. So we don't have enough data to really answer that question, but it makes me want to explore that further. And this data makes me say, huh, I think there is something to the way we constrain those behaviors in banking time that's important. So um, just in terms of future directions, we are continuing to analyze this data. The data that I've presented today will hopefully, hopefully be um, prepared for a manuscript and ready to go out by the end of the month. <laughs> um, my colleagues Jennifer locus alley Crouch and Jessica Whitaker and Jamie DeCosta are analyzing those treatment on the treatment data. We have lots of rich data to really better understand the mechanism um, of change that's occurring. And then um, we also have such rich observational data to really dig into and try to understand children's behave, disruptive behavior within the preschool context. So I'm really interested in taking that observational data and really breaking it down and seeing when and where kids are displaying disruptive behavior and how we might improve um, our observed um, effects. I will say that the lack of seeing um, um, effects and observations in the classroom is not new to this intervention. Lots of interventions, you get parent and teacher report and then you don't see those impacts in the classroom. So um, Jennifer locusalli Crouch has um, submitted a replication trial in order um, for us to test this intervention again with two and three year olds who are going even younger. Um, and we really want to collect more in implementation data on that child time condition and more information on kind of children's stress and do a better measurement of that. So with that, thank you all for your attention and I'll open it up for questions. So we often get that question. So the theory around that is that it's critical that it's the child's teacher. It's critical that the person whom the child needs to um, use as that resource in the classroom is the person that is conducting the sessions. Um, so it doesn't have to be the lead teacher. It could just as easily have been the assistant teacher. But what the theory of change is that these these interactions are going to let you see each other in a different way as a context of these interactions that you then use back in the classroom. So our data don't suggest that we, right. we, that we saw that in this, but that would be the theory of change. So we would say that doing this with a school psychologist wouldn't, we wouldn't expect that to then change behavior back in the classroom. Not for this particular intervention, which I would say is just a little bit different. So there is no kind of, we're not at necessarily asking teachers to do those behaviors back right in the classroom. Um, and that may be something, so we encourage them once the banking time sessions ended to continue trying to spend time with kids, but that wasn't an explicit part of the intervention. It's something that we've thought about, like we need, maybe we need to make that an explicit part of the intervention, and um, and I will say to you know, the the change that teachers reported in the um, in terms of children's behavior was based upon what kids are doing in the classroom. We just didn't have those independent observations to support that, which we would have really liked to have seen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
So teachers asked us about that. They, they had concerns about that as we were kind of working through how that was going to happen. So it happened in different ways in different types of programs. So sometimes a director would come in and spend time in the classroom so that the teacher could pull the child out for 10 minutes. Um, sometimes it was another person in the school that could come in. Sometimes those sessions were done either in the early morning when the ratios were really low or in the late afternoon for, the, for our full day programs. Um, and then sometimes they were done within the context of the day. So during um, center time where children are playing in centers, they would pull a kid into a particular center and play with them during that time. Teachers um, worried about the effect that that might have on other kids. Other kids are going to say, oh, you're spending time with him and not someone else. It, never, it was never. Um, they also worried that children were going to display lots of negative behavior in their sessions. And so we spent a lot of time on what to do. If that happened, it was hardly ever, ever an issue. Yeah? Um, in the first video that you showed with your daughter, yes. we saw an abrupt, abrupt change in her behavior from when she was leading the session to when the teacher switched to more traditional teaching Yes. Practices. And I was wondering if you could expound a little bit more on what you were saying to Kelly about that transition period and whether transitioning how, how do you transition out of baby time and could that be responsible for the, the small effects that you see across the classroom? Yeah, um, so, so you do see that kind of shift. You saw that shift in, in, um, in my daughter when you kind of switch over like that. And that is what, what banking time is supposed to do, right? It's supposed to lift some of the constraints that are, um, that are causing that negativity and directiveness, we put different constraints on to kind of open the opportunity for the child to show you who they are in those sessions. Um, and we don't have it, we certainly don't have any data that, that um, behavior problems increased as a result of this right afterwards. We, um, we had, in terms of ending that session um, at the end of an individual banking time session, what we would do is teachers would tell the kids, we have five more minutes in the session today, and then remind them of the next scheduled session. And children transferred in and out of those sessions pretty easily. Um, sometimes um, proactively, we would have the teacher schedule the banking time sessions to occur before a desired activity so that the kid was moving into an activity that they, that they would like. Um, and we rarely had trouble transitioning out of that. We also, um, teachers had concerns that when that seven weeks was over with, that that was also gonna, um, gonna be problematic. And so we really talked, we explained to kids in language that they could understand, I'm gonna work with you for a little bit, and then I'm gonna work with another kid and spend some time with another kid, but I'm still here for you in the classroom. And in some sense, we think that that worked in terms of teachers' perceptions, because we saw in, um, that teachers were indicating children's behavior improved not just from pre to post, but also from the beginning to the end of the year. Other questions? Yeah. Yeah, so since this seems like sort of it's difficult for teachers to carve out this time of their day, is this something that they could potentially do with two students at the same time? Or you know, is this something that can only be done at the time? No, we've, um, we've talked about that. I mean, we don't, we don't really know all the different ways that you could adapt this intervention. There's a really great questions about how do you scale up something. We've talked to teachers about, um, in some of the work that we're doing now, really chunking small amounts of banking time right there within the classroom. Like, spend two minutes with the kids in, in the block center. What we know from data is that teachers spend very little individual time with kids at all. So they're either doing kind of a large group instruction or kids are kind of doing their own thing without a lot of teacher scaffolding unless there's misbehavior. So we see not a ton of individual time with kids and when you do see it, it tends to be because the child's displaying negative behavior. So we have talked about kind of increasing those little pockets of individual time across the day. We have not tested to see if that's, if that's effective. It's actually one of the strategies that Jason Downer and I talk about in um, an early childhood mental health consultation model and actually for teachers to put 
the names of the kids in their classroom on the board and just make sure that they've spent some individual child-directed time within the preschool classroom every week with kids. Yes? Yeah, it was on average with other samples, not high. <laughs> so in general, what we find is children's positive engagement with teachers on average is fairly low. That happens because kids spend lots of time in preschool classroom totally unengaged with their teachers. So, and when, and when we do see positive engagement with teachers, um, happening, it tends to be within the context of circle time. So we, we were like, oh, make sure that we get a cycle of circle time with all of these kids because we were just less likely to see that. So kids will go out for recess and unless there's a problem, they may, they're most likely not to be interacting with the teacher at all. So we are looking at that data right now. So then really nice thing about us coding the banking time fidelity or those banking time behaviors across all teachers um, during that free play of the structured play test is in some ways we can see like, okay, our banking time behaviors in and of themselves, no matter what condition you are in, are those connected to what we see in the classroom? And Jennifer is not here anymore, but the indications are yes. So when teachers are doing those behaviors, it's connected to both kids' engagement in the classroom and um, classroom teachers' practices at the classroom level. Yeah? Can you go back to the slide with the uh, comparison of the, the averages uh, of the difference in This one? Yeah. So I was wondering here, um, so you're talking about if you didn't use the child time, or you may have made, made, made a conclusion. Um, but looking at this, uh, I mean, other than the count sportscaster, um, I guess the question, I mean, it doesn't look like, okay, I guess the lower, the, the second half of the table is a little bit more differentiated, but on the top half, Really, the only thing that's different between those two conditions is this count sportcaster. So anything in green here, I should have said this, anything in green is significant both between child time and business as usual. So these look small, but this is significantly different from these two. Here, we don't see a difference between banking time and child time. Right, so I'm wondering, like, in terms of, in terms of what that actually looks like in, in, in situation, like, it, it, what, what is that, what is like a point three difference in observation really mean? Like, maybe, I'm just wondering if there's not enough actual um, differentiation between the groups and maybe that's just why the effects are small is that, because really the only change, the only big thing there I mean, in terms of magnitude that is the, the sportscaster is like twice the size of the other one. Right? That's right, and these are, I will say these are on a, this is on, well, some of these. These are on like a five point scale here. Mm -hmm. Um, and here, and these are not big differences. But the other thing to consider here is this is not in the context of a banking time, of, of a true banking time session. So in some ways, this tells us that there's some generalizability of what's occurring in a banking time session across time. Um, and I think you're right. The, these are where you see some of the some of the bigger differences, right? But these are really important important things um, for banking time as well. I mean, and really, we think of this as just the fidelity as our kind of fidelity check. Okay. We said we were going to do an in intervention. Do we see that difference? I will also say, though, if you look at, um, we also coded these banking time fidelity indicators during cleanup, and these differences become bigger, right? So you institute a stress response onto the system, tell children to clean up and sort toys, and they don't want to do that. And then what we saw were that these differences were even bigger. Um, even though there was no difference in child behavior. So children were not less compliant, even though teachers were much less directive. Yeah? What are your expectations in terms of long, the longest term of this? Do you think this will expand over time? Uh, you know, 
I don't know. The, the theory would suggest that if we are changing children's kind of schema around what adults' relationships are, that we might then it, it expect that effect um, to continue on. But I think this is really also, we have to pay attention to like, are we changing the adult's schema? And so um, if we're thinking that maybe, in fact, we really are changing teachers' perceptions of kids' behaviors and maybe not their actual behaviors, then maybe we wouldn't expect those um, interventions to persist the next year unless the teacher was someone who was less likely to make negative attributions of kids or more likely to spend time really observing and trying to understand kids. I remember you said this, but do you see overall effects in the class in the classroom? For? Teacher quality in general? No. No. And, and we did not examine those as part, of, as part of these impacts. What we did look at, though, were whether or not teachers, the quality of teachers' class, um, interactions at the classroom level moderated the impacts. And I didn't go into those here, but we do see um, effects for that, both in terms of children's behavior outcomes and also in terms of children's positive engagement with teachers. So we do see that. And so we do see some of those observed effects there, which is nice. Yes. 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 No, um, we did, and I didn't include, we did focus groups with teachers, um, both in the banking time and child time conditions, and both groups of teachers said that, that these interactions, these sessions with them made, be, made them think about these kids differently, and that, in fact, they liked them better. <laughs> so they told us that, but on the teacher-child relationship scale, we didn't, we didn't see that. So even though they're telling us that, there's something kind of, um, there was something kind of missing there that, we, that honestly we're still kind of grappling with. Um, teachers in the banking time condition reported um, increased value in this intervention. They saw great value in it, and that was in comparison to both the business as usual and the child time um, conditions. So, um, and they really talk about how, like, wow, this intervention made me think about this kid in a really different way. Like, I, I hadn't sat back and just watched this kid. I learned something new about him that I wasn't learning in the classroom. Potentially, but we really tried for this intervention to not be, to not feel that way in some ways because of the way that we designed the setup of the intervention, right? So teachers are conducting banking time for a specified amount of time that is set up beforehand that's not being done, at least on an individual, on a day-to-day -day basis due to their disruptive behavior. So I don't think that that is, occur is, is occurring. Um, and if that was potentially occurring, we would have expected maybe to have seen behavior improvement during the window, so pre to post improvement, but not beginning and end of year effects. And we saw both. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yes, we did both of those things. We do not see any moderation of the impacts by window. We hypothesized that there would be, or we thought that there might be. We thought that like window two might be the sweet spot. So window one, you're ramping up, at least for banking time, you're learning how to do this. If you, might not, you might be having struggle with it. By kid two, you've got the rhythm, and kid three is toward the end of the year, and <laughs> things are never going well at the end of the year, so we thought that we'd have bigger impacts for kid two. We didn't, we didn't see that at all. 
we do see some differences, not so much in fidelity, but kind of like ease, teacher self reports of ease of being able to conduct the sessions. We do see differences across the window, but it wasn't displaying out in terms of differences in the behavior. Well, thank you all for this opportunity.